in what Google thinks are the right results. If we go back to the earlier screen, what's in the green boxes? Now, paid search, pay-per-click, pago-per-click, that's all paid search. Those are the ads that show up in those red boxes from the earlier screen, those ads that were on the top in the yellow box, and those ads that were down the right-hand side. And then if you hear me use the term search engine marketing or marketing and buscadores, that just refers to everything. So that would include SEO and pago per click. It would be everything. All right. Now, as an idea, just so I can help myself out, how many people, is anybody in the room currently using Google AdWords for your business? Okay, so you have some familiarity with this. I'm gonna go through the basics, but we'll talk through some tips on here as well. Google AdWords is the program that Google uses to serve up paid ads. Now, if you're not familiar with it, the reason it's called Pago Per Click should be pretty obvious. Your ad shows for free. Every time that shows up, it shows for free. It's unlike radio, unlike TV, unlike billboards. The first and only time you pay any money to the search engines is if somebody will click your ad and then you have control over how much you're willing to pay because you get to bid a different amount on every different keyword in your account as they can all have different values for you. Everything is based on keywords. Now, you will tell the search engines what are the types of things that people are searching for that you'd like to show up for. And you can get very, very restrictive and say, only show me on these particular keywords. Or you could say, you know what? There's no way I can think of every possible thing that might be a good search query for me. So you give Google a little bit more leeway and it's your choice how much leeway you want to give Google. The number one tip that I can give you, if you're using, uh, if you're running campaigns for yourselves and you give Google more leeway, that would be broad match for those of you that are using AdWords already, is to go very, very heavy on negative keywords. A negative keyword is something that if you use that in your account, Google can never show your ad. If that's part of the search query, they can never show you ad. And I'll give you a reason why. Recently, a client came to us that was running an AdWords account themselves for three years. They do military defense law, and they had a term in their account that was DOHA, D-O-H-A. Now, that has a, that's a special acronym that makes sense for them. There was a reason that they wanted to advertise on it, and it made sense. DOHA is also the capital of gutter. And so, over the course of three and a half years, they spent $10,000 on searches in Arabic. People looking for information in gutter. So you have to be very careful. That's the type of thing that if you use a lot of negative keywords, you can prevent that type of thing from happening. The other thing about AdWords and all other forms of uh, pago per click is that you have a lot of targeting options. So you can target down to the city level. You can target a particular region, the whole province. You can target a country, multiple countries around the world. You can even drop a pin down on a map and then say you want to show within 25 kilometers. Day of the week, you have full control over virtually everything that you do within these campaigns. Now, the absolute best thing about Google AdWords and paid search is that it's 100% tailor-made for testing. This is why I fell in love with it 12 years ago. If those of you have had any experience with direct marketing, it's very similar to direct marketing. It ends up being uh, like direct marketing on steroids because you get to see everything and whether it works or not. What I always tell our clients is that if we're a dog, if we do a bad job, you're gonna know that we did a bad job. If we do a great job, you're gonna know that we did a great job for you as well. One of the types of things that you can test, for example, is with ads. So you'll tell Google, hey, here are five different ads that I'm going to write. And you can put those in, and Google will randomly show those ads at different times. And so you get to see what's a winner, what come back and actually works better for you based on that information. And the nice thing is not only can you do that to optimize your campaign and get better results from your AdWords campaign, but you can also take that information back to your sales staff or back to your marketing staff and say, here are the phrases, here are the selling points 
that resonates with our, uh, with our customers, with our potential customers, and you can change around your marketing and your sales tactics based on that information. The other most important thing when you're running this is when you're measuring, you need to know what's a favorable result for you. And that can be a purchase online if you're doing e-commerce sales, that can be a newsletter sign up, that can be a phone call, that can be somebody submitting information. All of those things are called a conversion. And you get to track conversions within the AdWords account so that you know what keywords matter, what ads matter, and that you use your money in the smartest way possible. Now, again, we talked about Google AdWords. That is probably the only account that you need to run. If you're not running uh, any other accounts, start with Google AdWords. Depending within the Americas, if you are already at running AdWords and you would like to have a little bit more reach, you can run Bing Ads. And Bing Ads is the platform that will show your ads on Bing and on Yahoo. And then if you're going in other parts of the country, uh, I'm sorry, other parts of the world, Yandex, Baidu, Naver, Yahoo Search Marketing, they all have their own products for you. All right. Now, for the most part today, I'm going to talk about things that you can do right now to help out your accounts. There are two areas where these things are not yet available in Argentina, but I think that they're coming very soon. And so I want to show them to you so that you'll be ready when they come. This first one is product listing ads. And so those are ads that you'll see within Google that will show the picture of a product, a brief description, and pricing information. I would just tell you, these convert, these lead to sales at a much higher rate, typically, than the other ads that you would see that would be at the top of the page or down the right-hand side. And they cost you less per click. Now, I have a list up there. Brazil is the only country in South America that these are currently available. I reached out to my insider at Google and I said, is this coming soon for Argentina? She didn't know, so I don't have a date for you. But Google is making a lot of money on these. And anytime Google is making a lot of money, they're going to expand it to other areas. So I'd expect that this will come to Argentina soon. All right. Not exactly pay-per-click or not exactly paid search, but there are other sites that if you're running e-commerce, if you're selling things online, or you're able to sell them online, are good for you as well. I'm sure that everybody here is familiar with Mercado Libre and with Amazon. Alibaba is another site that you might want to check out. It's another marketplace. It's a Chinese-based uh, marketplace, but it does serve all over the world, and it's actually larger than Amazon and eBay combined. So it's the largest marketplace in the world. I've put these up here, those three logos that are smaller, down on the left-hand side, those are all shopping comparison engines, and it's a little bit different than a marketplace. With a Mercado Libre, with an Amazon, you can upload your products to them. You don't need to sell them on your website. With a shopping comparison engine, you will need to sell the objects on your website. Those particular ones do have options available in Spanish, but are not marketing to Latin America. So you may want to check those out, but I do believe that they're, uh, any of their Spanish sites, they're really only targeting Spain. All right. So that was paid search. We're going to move now into SEO. And with SEO, the one thing I want to make clear, because this is a common mis misconception to lots of different companies and people that I speak with, is there is an absolute firewall between Pago Per Click, Google AdWords, and Google's natural results. They're absolutely separate. The more money you pay to Google, that can help you out with your AdWords, it can get your ads to show more often, but it will absolutely 100% not help your positioning within the organic results. Just like with paid search, it is all based on keywords. What's a little bit different, or what's completely different, is that you cannot buy spots within Google. None of the information uh, is available for purchase. This is just what Google thinks is the right answer. And all of those things are based on Google's algorithm, which is just a big fancy word for its formula, where it tries to produce the best results or the right results. Now, we don't know what that formula is. And Google makes changes to it more than once per day, and there are hundreds of different variables. But over time, and through experimentation and through research, we're able to determine what are some of the common themes that will actually help your website out and get it to move up the rankings. The first category is content on your website. 
So it makes sense, right? If Google is going to send traffic to your website based on someone's search, they want to make sure that you're actually talking about that information on your page. One thing to keep in mind, you can only rank a page on your website for one to two keyword phrases. So if you want to rank for a lot of different things, a lot of different uh, uh, search queries that a person could type into the search engines, you need to have a lot of different pages on your website. Your home page will not rank for 100 different terms. Now, it makes sense. You talk about you need to have content on your website for Google to like, but how does Google know that you're not out there just making up information that's incorrect? What they rely on is third-party verification. And traditionally, the way that they've relied on that are other sites linking back to your website. Whether that would be a press release, whether that could be a news article, whether that would be um, something on another site that you own, uh, whether it would be a customer of yours. All of those are ways to send links back to your website. And they all are, in effect, vouching for your site as good sources of information so that Google has kind of a checks and balances thing going on. And what's become increasingly important over the last two years, although Google uh, uh, officially says that this is not the case, but we know differently, are what I'd call social mentions. Social mentions. So those are things when people like your page on Facebook, and not your page, but like a page on your website through Facebook. When they tweet about it with a link, when they would pin something on Pinterest, when they would share information through LinkedIn, when they would upvote something through StumbleUpon, those are all independent individual users you, uh, citing your site as a good source of information. Those were things that will help your website out. If you're looking to drive links to your website, and that is by far the single most difficult thing with search engine optimization, and it's probably the single most important thing with search engine optimization, there are two tactics that I would highly recommend to you. The first are contests. People will do anything for content. People do anything for free t-shirts, right? It doesn't even have to be something where you're giving away something of high value. Although in general, the higher the incentive, the more that people will do to reach that incentive. But when you can do those contests, that's a great way for you to get more, um, to drive links back to your site naturally and can really help you out. And the second way that I would mention are infographics. So when you can take information, complex information, and put it in an easy way for people to understand, that ends up getting shared a lot. It'll drive a lot of social mentions. It'll drive a lot of links. All right. And finally, I think what most of us think about when we talk about SEO is how do we rank within Google's main web results. Keep in mind that for SEO, you can also uh, rank within news, you can rank within pictures, you can rank within videos. And I would say if you were looking for one area, you thought it was very tough competition, the one area where you have the most opportunity right now is with videos. You can get videos to rank much more easily because most of your competition is not using them. And people start to get a little bit worried about videos because they say, oh, I have to do a professional video, I have to pay a company a lot of money to come in and make sure that everything looks right. That's not true with YouTube or with other places where you would put videos online. You only have to get two things right with YouTube, uh, with any online video. Decent lighting and decent sound. If you get everything else right, people will forgive a lot of things. All right. And again, I want to give two tips um, or, or mention just a, a couple things very briefly if you are looking to go outside of Argentina. Uh, number one, these two steps that you see on the screen are absolute must-dos. Most of the things I'll talk about today, you can experiment to see what works with for you. These are things that you have to do. Generally speaking, you cannot rank a site across the world. It sounds great, but if you want to rank in all the different countries, you need to set up content specifically for the different countries, even if they're speaking the same language to get the best results. So choose, number one, choose specifically what are those countries that you want to reach? And number two, you decide on what URL structure you want to use. I'm not going to belabor it. It's a pretty technical thing. But whether you choose to have a completely separate website, a separate subdomain, or a separate 
uh, subdirectory. Those are all choices you make. They're going to have a lot of different technical ramifications for you. And it, there's not one right answer. But I'm happy to go into that if anybody has questions about it uh, afterwards and go into those considerations. All right. International SEO tips. One thing is sign up, and this is good for everybody, whether you're going international or whether you're going local. There's a uh, Google service you can log into. It's free, like most Google products, called Google Webmaster Tools. Google Webmaster Tools. And you'll want to create an account there just to tell Google certain things like how often to crawl your website. They'll tell you about errors on your site. They'll give you tips for how to fix it. You can also tie it to your Google Analytics package. But if you are going after international, it can you can tell Google specifically which content you want to rank for which country. Google should hopefully figure it out, but sometimes that's not the case. Next tip is you want to make sure that you're building links and social mentions from that country specifically. So if you're targeting Brazil, Marco, then you would want to make sure that you are getting links from Brazilian websites that will rank your site higher if you can get those. If you do have a physical office there, make sure that you list your physical address and your phone number. And then finally, if you're doing translation, make sure that after you do the translation, you go ahead and re-optimize your content. Sometimes that keyword focus gets lost during the translation process. All right. Now, one of my absolute favorite topics, online reputation management. And we're going to start by talking about it for businesses. And if you hear me say ORM, online reputation management, the very first thing that I want to make sure everybody understands is that the first page of Google is now your company's reputation. It's the first thing people do. And they're going to look you up. Probably not even go to your website first. They're probably going to start just by looking you up and seeing what the results are. And so it's very important you want to start by having as many positive results on the first page of Google as possible. Because one bad result can end up hurting you tremendously if you aren't already ranking in a lot of different spots on that first page. And I'll give you an example. Recently, a, a, um, uh, a construction service company came to us. They had a problem where um, an environmental agency in the United States fined them for something that they did. And they didn't rank very well on their website. They didn't rank for anything else on the first page of Google. So anytime somebody looked them up, they saw two news articles talking about their fine. They literally had their phone, they could tell just by the number of phone calls were dropping dramatically because people weren't then going to their website, they weren't contacting them, they just saw something really negative about this company, assumed that they were a bad company, and didn't want to contact them. So they came to us, and we had to create social media profiles, we had to create news articles, we had to create press releases, we had to help competitors with similar names show up higher, we had to get more pages on their website to rank, just to get all of that information moved off the first page. In almost all cases, you cannot get a negative result removed from the search engines. All you can do is push it down. And so your goal is to push those down off of the first page. That company ended up having to pay us a lot of money. Good for us, bad for them, because we had a lot of work to do because they had virtually no web presence. So what I encourage all of you to do is not to fall in that trap where something negative could happen and it's not always something that's negative that's actual. It could be something negative that a competitor makes up. It could be something where a customer makes up to try to scam you. <laughs> One of the companies that we talked to uh, was a trucking company, and they actually had a competitor make a video of their store, uh, it took a picture of uh, uh, this company's store, and blew it up, like did the graphics to blow it up into smithereens like with an atomic bomb. And so that actually was the first thing that came up there. I don't think it actually hurt their business, but it drove that business crazy because they didn't have their own videos there. So this company had never done anything wrong, but they had to deal with that. But it wouldn't have been as bad if they had had other videos already out there. Now, with online reputation management, there are three parts, and they're interchangeable parts. The first is planning. 
making sure that you have a plan in place so that if something negative does happen, deserve it or not deserve it, you know how to respond to it. And part of that plan, the biggest part, is by having a great web presence now. Second thing is monitoring. You have to know what's being said about you. People aren't going to come up to your door and knock on it and tell you something bad is being said. You need to be following that yourself. The first tip I would give everybody is, it's an old one, but it's still relevant, is Google Alerts. Google Alerts. So you would go to google.com slash alerts. It's a free service. And when you sign up for that free service, it'll tell you anytime Google indexes something, something about your company or something about one of your executives. You can tell them the information that you're interested in. And that does a pretty good job of telling you when new information hits the web. It does not do a very good job of telling you when new information hits social media. Okay, So if something negative is coming up on Facebook or on Twitter or any other site, it's not going to tell you that. You would want to either monitor those sites yourself or depending on your budget, you could sign up for a service like a tracker or like a NetBase where you could then be notified anytime something negative comes up there. And finally, figure out how you're going to respond. I would say that in most cases, you always want to respond to something that's negative, but you want to do it in a professional manner. I think we've all seen cases of businesses not doing that. They take personal offense to it, they end up starting a flame war with that customer and end up losing a lot of business because of it. Now, ratings and review sites. These are perhaps more important than anything else within this. We're going to show a slide in a second. You want to claim any site where people can leave information about your company or where they can rank information about your company to give it a particular star rating. And those would be things like local search. Again, we'll show you. Those could be review sites like a TripAdvisor. As all of you know, the people that are going to leave reviews are the people that are angry with you, people that have felt wronged by you, that are upset with you. You all have customers that love you, but they don't think to go and leave a review. They only do it when they're upset about something. So an extremely important part of this is making sure that you're encouraging your customers to leave positive reviews for you. And the only two things, I should say leaving reviews for you. There are only two things you have to keep in mind when you tell a customer, hey, please rank me on this site. Number one, don't have them do it on your website. Uh, I'm sorry, on your physical property. You think that makes the most sense because it's the time they're happiest. They just bought something from you. They just met with you. They're very excited. But Google or uh, any of the review sites look at your IP address. And so what they think is happening is that you're scamming them, that you're writing the review yourself. So don't have them do it on your property. And the second is you can encourage people to leave reviews. You cannot encourage people to leave positive reviews. So when you're incentivizing for a positive review, that's something that will get your reviews filtered out. All right. Now, this was a search that I did yesterday. And I started looking up restaurants in Cordoba. And this company came up first. Restaurante San Horonato. No? Honorato. I'm a little bit dyslexic, apparently. What are the first two things that you notice? Let's see if we can do the... These jump out at me immediately. When I see the star ratings down here, and I see the star ratings right here. And th in this case, it's a very good thing. They have a 4.7 out of five rating. But there are a lot of other restaurants, there are a lot of other businesses out there that don't have that information. I would encourage all of you, do it right now if you have a computer pulled up, or do it afterwards, but go do a search for your company and see what shows up. A lot of you are going to have this huge, huge, huge information down the right-hand side. It's the first thing that everybody's going to see. Now, a little bit lower on the screen, what you'll see is, is this your business? That means that your site, that your local site has not been claimed. Google doesn't know that you own that, that you're the owner of that establishment. So the first thing you want to do is ver click on that link and verify it. And then you can either have Google send you a postcard or call you with a verification code that you enter. But you want to claim that. Once you do that, you can build a link back to your website. You can put up pictures. You can put up the information that best portrays your business. And you can then officially respond to anybody that leaves a review. Otherwise, you have to log in as somebody else. It'll probably get filtered out.
Now, what I've been talking about for the most part is negative examples, where people are using online reputation management because of something the negative that happened to them and they're trying to be reactionary to it. Now, excuse my typo on here. I wanna talk about a different story because the flip side is doing all of this actually can help your business. It can drive more business. It can create more revenue for you. And I'm gonna use a personal example. So right before I came to Argentina, my wife and I went to um, Istanbul and to Greece. And so for Istanbul, she started researching what were the activities that we wanted to do. And so she went to TripAdvisor, as many of you probably do. And the number one thing to do at that time listed for TripAdvisor was something called The Other Tour, and it was run by these two brothers. Great time. It was absolutely worth it. It was our favorite day in Istanbul. So I talked to the brothers, and I said, well, how did you, you know, what, what's your strategy? How did you end up getting so popular? And they said, well, one of our other brothers actually started this business two years ago, and the way he did it was that he went around to hostels and he told these people in the hostels, listen, I will give you a free tour of the non-touristy aspects of Istanbul for free. But the catch? Had to leave a review on TripAdvisor. And so after a period of just a couple months, their business shot up to number one on Istanbul, uh, things to do on TripAdvisor, and they started making, I would just say, a very large amount of money for these brothers by doing it. So when you have those types of things, when you have that plan in place, you can use it to actually create more revenue. The final thing I'll say about this is you still have to be careful. The younger brother who was running this started doing some things that some of their customers didn't like so much, uh, making some uh, uh, religious comments that he thought was funny that, uh, that some of these people did not think were so funny. And so they started getting a lot of negative reviews. They're now down to number 11. That brother's out. I think they're going to rise back up. But just be aware that if you're relying on that, you have to keep satisfying your customers or you will drop. All right. For any educators in the room or for any parents, I cannot, cannot, cannot stress this enough. We work with businesses, but virtually everything that I've just mentioned in the last 10 minutes is also related to personal. And this is a scary, scary world these days because young people are putting information out on the web not thinking that there are going to be consequences, whether they're using something on Facebook or Instagram or Vine or Snapchat. These are things that are going to live with them. These are things that uh, schools will look at. These are things that their peers will look at. These are things that job opportunities, that HR departments will look at. So I would just ask all of you to please think about this and talk about it with the young people that you know, because they don't think about the consequences and it's something that can follow them around for years and years and years afterward. The problem with technology is it advances faster than people can advance with how they should use it appropriately. All right, now we move back into advertising. We're gonna talk about display network advertising. So you can buy ads directly from a website, and that's where you would put your banner ad on a particular website, and you can buy that from the publisher, the owner of that website, or you could buy it through a network. And one of the advantages of a network is that you can actually do it where you're buying it on a per-click basis or per thousand impressions basis. And the great thing when you can do it on a per-click basis is your ad might be seen 700, 800, 900 times for free. The first and only time that you pay is when it gets clicked on, but there's a lot higher ratios than they are in search. So you can get a lot more branding, a lot more reach at a very low cost because you're gonna only pay per click. And those ads can be image ads, they can be text ads, they can be um, moving ads that you can even interact with. One of the networks that allows you to do this is the Google AdWords display, uh, is Google AdWords, and they have a tool called the Display Builder. And so if you're a smaller company and you don't have a graphic artist in-house with you, you can use this display ad builder to create ads just based on logos and pictures and text that you'll provide, and it works okay. It's not as good as a graphic designer, but it's good enough for you to get something acceptable out there. All right, now there are three main ways that you can target using a display network. And the first is, you can have your ads based on a particular site that you want them to appear on. 
So you can say, I want to be on this site, or even this section, or even this page of a particular website. The second way has to do with content. It's sometimes called contextual advertising. And that way you can have your ad appear anytime that content is written that's related to your business. So if you're a travel company and there is a uh, site for, uh, there's content talking about Columbia, you could advertise your flight specials to Columbia on that particular page. And the third type is with user behavior, okay? And I'm gonna get really excited and I'll try not to speak too quickly, but this is the time that if you haven't already, you're gonna say that Justin has gone completely loco because I'm most excited about this and I have this guy up on the screen, okay? This concept is called retargeting and it's happened to everybody in this room. I'm not sure if stalking translates, but that's kind of on its bad case, that's where the guy's outside in your bushes, hiding in the bushes and he's peeping into the windows. You visited a website before, maybe a clothing store. You look at some clothes, you leave that website, and you go to another website. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing ads from that same clothing store on the new websites. And maybe if they're really slick, they're showing you ads for that same shirt that you already saw. What's happened is you went to a website, a cookie was uploaded onto your browser, and then you can serve ads to people based on that. If you do too much of it, you're this guy, right? And it, that's happened to all of us. You've seen an ad over and over and over again, and you decided, I'm never buying anything from these people. I'm so annoyed with them. But you can put caps on it so it's not that bad. It's extremely effective and extremely low cost. It's especially effective for e-commerce sites where somebody has put something into their shopping cart but then left without purchasing. They've abandoned their shopping cart. And then you can serve up an ad to them later saying, hey, we'll give you 10% off or we'll give you free shipping. Site retargeting can work very well. There's also a newer form, and this is something everybody here can do through uh, different ad exchanges, one of which is ad roll. You could do Facebook retargeting where you're gonna serve the ads to people based on them having visited your website. It's gonna show up when they're on Facebook, whether they're on their phone or whether they're on their computer. And finally, there's something called search retargeting. Search retargeting. That gets really creepy because that's based on something that you've searched for in the past. My favorite uh, uh, use of search retargeting is for your competitors, right? Somebody searches for your competitor, you don't wanna serve up an ad there, then your competitor sees it, then their lawyers call you, then they start sending you all sorts of nasty notes and it ends up becoming a big headache, it's not worth it. But with search retargeting, your ad doesn't show up right then and there. Your ad ends up showing up after they leave that search engine, they go on to other websites, so your competitor never knows that you're doing that. All right, finally, and this is the last part today, we're gonna talk about social media advertising. There are different forms, there are different sites you can do this on. Uh, there are three ones that I think have real uh, benefit that we've seen put to good use. And the first are Facebook ads. And for those of you that have done these, with Facebook ads, you can target people, its biggest benefit is you can target people by their stated likes or interests. They've told Facebook what they like. And then you can serve up ads to them. Well, a few months ago, Facebook started incorporating real world data off Facebook into their system. So you can then layer in information such as where has the person uh, uh, said that they uh, drive a particular type of car, whether they like a particular sports team, and you're able to tie that into their official likes on Facebook. And, I, and now, Facebook is finally, finally, finally figuring out the mobile piece. They're not doing it well, but you can now serve up ads on uh, mobile devices, which you could not for years. Now, with Twitter, there are three types of promoted products that they offer. The first are promoted trends. Promoted trends start at the low, low cost of only $150,000 per day, if you wanna do that. That's US dollars uh, with Twitter. It's a little bit different based on other countries. That's not a, it's not something that's recommended. It's not something that's affordable for most companies. But there are two other types of products that they offer. The first is the promoted account. And you can target people by geography. You can target people by um, 
uh, by being a follower of a particular account, you can target people by their likes and interests. You can target males and females. And you only pay when somebody follows you based on seeing that ad. You can also do promoted tweets. Somebody reads, they favorite, they reply to you. Two new features that Twitter's offered with this is keyword targeting in real time. So you can serve up an ad to somebody right when they're talking about something that's related to what you do. And they also offer lead generation cards that make it extremely easy, and it's the best thing I've seen so far for B2B with Twitter, business to business, where you can serve up ads uh, to the people, they can click on a link, and automatically that information is shared with you as the advertiser. Yeah. This is the second thing. This is the second thing I've talked about today. This is currently not available in Argentina. In the United States, there are two different types of accounts. One is a self-service account with no minimum. I assume that'll be coming to Argentina very soon. It's not available yet. The full service account is not available either. The full service account requires a minimum commitment of 15,000 US dollars to be used over three months. If you're really interested in this, you could work with an advertising agency within the US or the United Kingdom, and they would be able to um, set up an account for you from them uh, their account with uh, your account, but their information with Twitter. But I would expect that this information will roll out very soon to Argentina. And finally, LinkedIn ads. And the benefit of LinkedIn ads is they allow you to do advertisements based on the particular company, their industry, or their size, or to serve up ads to people based on their job title, their job, uh, uh, the type of job that they do, or their seniority level. And the thing that they've released just in the past month are sponsored updates. And those sponsored updates have huge, huge, huge engagement rates. So with direct ads, traditionally with Twitter, a lot of times they have very low um, engagement. But these, these sponsored updates have very high engagement. So if you're going to try something with LinkedIn, this is the area that I would expect you to, or that I would recommend that you start with. So that's it, and I thank everybody for your time today. <coughs> Muy bien, muchas gracias, Justin Seibert. Eh, si alguno tiene alguna pregunta, eh, no hace falta que la hagan en inglés, está la, la traductora, así que si quieren preguntar algo, ¿alguien tendrá alguna duda? Bueno, <ríe> muy bien. Entonces vamos a, a dar cierre a esta jornada. Eh, en primer lugar, queremos agradecer a todos ustedes por estar aquí, por habernos acompañado. Agradecer a las autoridades también que compartieron este momento con nosotros. Eh, ha sido una jornada muy importante, muy fructífera. Hemos escuchado a referentes destacados provenientes de distintos países que han hecho un aporte muy valioso al tema que nos está convocando hoy. Nos vamos a reencontrar mañana en la Universidad Blas Pascal. Esto va a ser a las 9 de la mañana para la ronda de negocios. Eh, y por la mañana también va a estar... Fernando Patrito de Intel Córdoba, quien dará una conferencia sobre el desarrollo de proveedores locales. Van a participar también de la ronda los expositores que hoy estuvieron presentes y operadores internacionales convocados por los socios del clúster. Eh, nuevamente les agradecemos también a las empresas sponsor que nos han acompañado, entre ellas Visa, Goldway Internet, eh, Universidad Blas Pascal. Pro Córdoba, Cadena 3 Argentina, Santander Río, Swiss Medical e instituciones que, apoyaron, que apoyan esta iniciativa, este congreso. Entre ellas, ERSAT, Agi y Asociados, Vision, SIECA, Comercio y Justicia, Consuman, Consultores PYME, Despegue Emprendedor, DLR, GAPS, Colegio Universitario IES Siglo XXI, Intertron Mobile, CUNAN, Lempert, Mentes, Netnica, Pentamedia, Parque Empresarial Aeropuerto, PricewaterhouseCoopers, Bates Ingeniería de Software, Vectus y Sonda. Muchísimas gracias a todos. Nos encontraremos entonces mañana en Blas Pascal a partir de las 9 de la mañana. Que tengan una hermosa tarde. Buenas tardes. Gracias.